Sam, and good morning, Loft. Um, I am learning how to say no to some things, and I think Sam is trying his hardest to ask me a lot of things before I master that skill. So, <laughs> alas, I am here today. Um, we've been going through a, a short series in the Psalms, and um, I believe we're going to be leading into the, the preaching cohort. And um, Sam had done a couple um, sermons on the Psalms, and I wanted to do a, a follow-up. And I'm excited to do a, a reading of Psalm 1 for you today. So um, could I ask you to please stand with me while we read the word? Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would be with us today, that those here who need to hear these words would, would open their ears and be sensitive to your word. Father, I ask that you give me um, wisdom through my study, wisdom through nothing that I've done, but, but what you've already done, and you just want to pass off to your flock. Father, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. You can be seated. So the Psalms are interesting. They're kind of like bodies of water around our earth. Um, each body is unique. Some of them are like rivers. They meander. They're narrow. They might be wider. Um, and other ones are still and big, smooth like silk. Some of them are full of salt and have sand. And other ones are, are fresh but with mud. And even though they can be so different, they also have a lot of similar qualities. Many lakes and oceans and rivers around the world are similar to other lakes, rivers, and oceans. For example, each river starts small, goes in one direction, and as it goes, it becomes bigger, emptying its contents into a larger body of water. Well, the Psalms are like that. There are Psalms of lament, there are Psalms of joy, and they tend to follow a similar structure to other psalms of lament and psalms of joy. But what's interesting about the Psalter is that every single one of them leads back to the praise of God, even the ones that are sorrowful. Now, the psalms are mostly prayers and hymns. David wrote most of them. Moses wrote a couple. So did Solomon. And the psalms span over a thousand years. So there's a lot of history here that we're collecting. And they're not placed in chronological order. So we have to ask ourselves, why is the first chapter of Psalms placed where it is? It wasn't the first written. In fact, it was probably one of the newer ones. But what Psalm 1 is doing, and why it's different, is it's trying to teach something. It reads more like a proverb than a psalm, because it's not a cry for help, it's not a lament, and it's not a praise either. It's a wisdom psalm, and it's one of the few. It's strategically placed because Psalm 1 wants to prepare us for how to read the rest of the Psalms and naturally the rest of Scripture. Now, the point can be pretty easy to miss. It is near the beginning, but I think the writer's a bit long-winded, so people might, might read past it. Um, but it takes me to my first point, which is that we are to be saturated in Scripture. Verse 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the way of counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. If we look closely, you can see the statement. Take out the ending of verse 1 where it says, walks not, stands not, sits not, and you see, blessed is the man who what? He meditates on the law of the Lord. This passage is going to promise us something to the person who can excel in that practice, and we'll get to that later. But that's the promise. 
you're blessed if you meditate. What does that mean? Those are kind of confusing words, and I think we need some clarification. A blessing isn't what we Western thinkers usually think of. Often, we'll over-spiritualize it. We'll say a blessing is something really, I can't, I can't put my finger on it, I can't grasp it. We make it so spiritual that it's just something that's out of reach. We don't even really know what we're talking about when we say, uh, I hope you're blessed. Either that, or we swing to the other side, and it's something so simple, and we use it flippantly like a hashtag on Pinterest on a food post. I don't think it's either one of those things. I think we need to realize that it's simple, but not that simple. The most simple definition for blessed is happy. That's what blessed means, happiness. The word is ashre, which in wisdom literature generally means someone who is fortunate or someone who is privileged. Now, before we go too far, I want to address what this passage is not about. It's not about our privilege. Ashray does not mean that we will prosper in the way that we might think. We've heard of the term prosperity gospel. That's not what this passage is talking about. It's not saying that God's going to give you everything on a silver platter if you meditate. That's not what blessing means. How do we know this? If we look at Job, you know that guy that was really happy? Turn to his book. In chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Reproves means correct. The uh, Holman version says, See how happy, instead of blessed, see how happy the man is who God corrects. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not too happy when I'm corrected. <laughs> and I don't think my son is either. He generally gets kind of frustrated and mad when I correct him. Some of you might be thinking, well, you know, these are Old Testament passages. Maybe it's an Old Testament thing. Maybe blessed means something different. Let's turn to the New Testament with Jesus, that guy who loves everyone. The Greek equivalent of Ashray is makarios, which is found in the Beatitudes, Jesus' uh, famous sermon. He says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, in Matthew uh, 5, verses 3 through 11. And he says, blessed are, he starts with the poor in spirit. And then he ends with those who are persecuted. It doesn't sound like he's talking about a prosperity gospel. He's talking about an inward happiness. Something that transcends your outside circumstances. And how do we know that? After blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says it in verse 3, and then he bookends it in verse 10. For, those, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is talking about not being handed things because you worship him, not being handed things because you meditate on the law, but having an otherworldly happiness that is not dictated by your circumstances. It's interesting that he, he ends those with uh, there's the kingdom of heaven because he's trying to get his people and trying to get us to look at something differently. Okay, so we get it. We're not talking about someone getting something. We're talking about someone being happy. Happy how? In verse 1, it says, blessed is the man who walks not. So we're going to see first what happiness is not. Not walking in the way of the counsel of the wicked, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of scoffers. Now, often in the Psalms, we need to be aware of poetic devices because these are poems and prayers. And one that the Psalms use pretty often is called anaphora, which is basically repeating the same thing for emphasis. So we need to ask ourselves, is that what's happening here? Are these the same thing as walking and standing and sitting a repeat? Is the counsel of the wicked, the way of the sinners, the seat of the scoffers, a repeat? I would contend that it's not. We can clearly see a progression. First, walking in the counsel of the wicked is thinking like the wicked. You're asking them for counsel. You're asking them for advice, and you might be taking their advice. You're beginning to think like a wicked person. And then we see that you're standing in the way of a sinner. It doesn't mean like you're, you need to get them out of the way. You're not standing in their way. You're standing like them. You're beginning to behave like a sinner. 
And then finally we see that you're sitting in the seat of the scoffer. This means that you belong. Isn't it much easier to walk with a group of people? I mean, we've done it. You probably walked at, at the mall with a group of people when you didn't even ha like half of them. <laughs> but how much harder would it be to take those same people and sit down and have dinner with them? Where you sit is where you belong. When you make it somewhere, when you like, I, I, got a, I finally got this job, I finally made it, what do people say? They say, I got a seat at the table. You're starting to identify with that thing. It was true in that culture. When this was written, you know, if you sat with the Greeks, you probably identified as a Greek. If you sat with the Romans, you probably identified with the Romans. If you sit with the Jews, you're probably Jewish. And it's true today in our culture. Um, we can also see a progression not only with what you're doing, but with the people that you're doing it with. Wicked is, is a pretty generic term for bad people. And then it narrows down to a more specific group. We see sinners. And then furthermore, scoffers. Now, scoffers is an interesting term. It doesn't seem like scoffers would be bad, like worse than sinners. But think about it this way. What is the last time, what, what were you doing? When was the last time you scoffed at someone? You might be in an argument with someone, and you don't even know what to say. You're just like, <sighs> <sighs> like your argument is so invalid, you just make noises at them. <laughs> Why? Is it because you had so much good thoughts to say, and you just had this well-crafted argument, you're scoffing at them because you identify so strongly against that person or what they're standing for. The NBA Finals this year were the Raptors versus Golden State. Go Raptors. Woo! Um, <laughs> if anyone told me that Golden State was going to win, I'd scoff at them. The Raptors got it, bro. The Raptors are going to win because, I mean, they were good. But I identified with them. I wanted them to win. They hadn't won before. Uh, Kawhi's awesome, and he's humble. And that's what I identified with. So I'd scoff at anyone asking me if I thought that the Golden State Warriors would win. I identified wholeheartedly as a Raptor. I've never been to Toronto, and I was a Raptor. We see the sequence, walk, stand, and sit. And it's envisioning a progression from a relative casual association to a complete identification. It's getting stronger. Uh, my wife and I just went and saw The Lion King the other day. Um, we're celebrating five years, so there she is. She's beautiful. Um, and we're cool, so we saw The Lion King. Um, it's one of our favorite movies. I knew she'd want it, so don't worry. Um, but you see something. So the characters are Mufasa and, and Scar, and there's a couple others. But Mufasa is the, the king of, of all the land, right? He's, he's the king of the pride lands. He's got this house he calls the Pride Rock. And, and his brother, uh, Scar, is never around. He's never in Pride Rock. Why? He's younger, weaker than Mufasa. So he sits in other places, in dark places, with hyenas. He is chosen because he feels like an outcast. He identifies with being an outcast, so he has literally cast himself out. He does not sit with the other lions because he feels and identifies as an outcast. And what's interesting is when he finally does come to power, the rest of the lion's den doesn't come out. Um, Scar takes his place on Pride Rock, and none of the other lions join him because they're making a stance. They're choosing not to sit with that scoffer. So wickedness is the general term. Sinners, scoffers is the worst. It starts slow. You know, you might start accepting people's advice. You begin, maybe because of that advice, adopting their ways until you identify and make that way your way. It's a progression. So what are we supposed to do? Step one, if you want to be happy, avoid thinking, behaving, and identifying with the wicked. Okay. Step two, we're supposed to meditate on the law. It says in verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, we need to ask ourselves a question here, because often when we hear the word law, our mind jumps to what? The Pentateuch. It's always the five books. Those are the law. Everyone knows it. Well, that's not what he's saying here. Um, I think he's referring to something else. If we take a look at 1 Corinthians, 
in chapter 14, we see that Paul is quoting Isaiah 28. So not the Pentateuch. It's a prophetic book. And he refers to that as the law. And he does the same thing in Romans, and yet he's not referring to the Pentateuch. He's referring to Job, Ezekiel, and the Psalms. So something's wrong here because Paul was a smart man. He was educated in the law. He went to school, which a lot of people didn't. He was an educated man, so why was he calling these books the law? And Jesus does the same thing. When he's questioning the Pharisees in John 10, he says, isn't it written in your law? So he's kind of like giving him that verbal backhand because they know the law, and he's, you know, antagonizing them. He says, isn't it written in your law? And then he, he recites Psalm 90 or uh, 82. He's reciting a psalm, and he does the same thing in John 15. He recites Psalm 32 and 69 and says, this is your law. Something different is happening here. The psalmist, Paul, and Jesus knew something about the scripture that was changing their lives and changing the way that they viewed scripture. They're not talking about the rules of the Bible, the Pentateuch, where you find literally law, but they're referring to the Bible as a whole, as an authority over their life. The life, or their life, is controlled by the law, which is all of Scripture. I can't speak too much more on this because we have cookies to eat. Um, but the long and short of it is, is, is reading Scripture alone is not going to save you. It's not going to change you until you believe that it has authority, until you give up your own authority and say, I trust this book. Only then will it have the power to change your life. And you ask why. Why can't I have control? The reason is this. When you don't believe that you have power and you write off the book, what's going to happen when you feel powerless and you have nothing to turn to because you don't already trust this? Or what will you do if you, you believe I'm modern, I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I don't need these old words. And then when you feel unloved, you don't believe when Jesus says, you're a beloved son and daughter. Sam always uses this picture, and it's a great one. Um, if you're falling off a cliff, you're going to grab something, right? And you might grab onto a root or something jetting out from the cliff. It's an instinct to grab that root. And you're not wondering if that root's going to hold you, you just grab it. And the point is, is not that I'm pondering and thinking, well, I don't know if this root really exists. I don't know if it's strong enough. I don't know if roots are even real. You just grab it. And the reality of what you're grabbing saves you. All right, so how can we be, how can we be happy? We'll get off the tangent. How can we be happy? How can we obtain a shre. We're not supposed to be like the scoffers. We're supposed to delight in the law. And then we, you know, look to Jesus. We're finding out that Jesus, it, it, the, all of the scripture is the law. It's not just the, the Pentateuch. And then what? We meditate on it day and night. Now, meditate is similar to blessing in that it's, um, it's sometimes more spiritualized than, than we need it to be or that it's oversimplified. Um, but what it literally means is to quietly recite to yourself. It means to mumble or murmur the words. So you meditate. You just mumble these things over and over and over. It refers to an intense study and reflection. So oftentimes we think, you know, when we're, we want to study the word, um, I, might, I might go sit down in the morning because early morning is spiritual. Everyone knows that. And I'll, I'll sit down. I'll wake up like, like 3 a.m. I'm super spiritual. And I'll read. I might read like seven chapters. And, um, and then I'll, I'll pray about it. And I think I've earned enough spiritual points for the day. That's not what we're talking about here, because you get into this argument, like, how much is enough? Have I done enough for today? I don't know. Maybe I should read eight chapters tomorrow. Is that a strong, rich, intense study, or are we just getting it done, marking off the to-do list? If a plant acted like that and said, oh, here's, here's some water, I'm going to study it. It sometimes has a ripple, and there's some waves, and it meanders. That's interesting. I'll go on with my day. The plant's not going to last very long. It needs to draw the water up into its roots. It needs to soak in the water. 
It has to become saturated in the water. So meditation takes time because like a plant growing its roots, that takes time. Meditation takes time. And if we want to do more than just know scripture for the sake of knowing it, we have to meditate. We have to go back and forth with the word, go into each individual word, go into each individual line. Ask, what does this mean? Ask hard questions. God's big enough to answer them for you. And then day and night. He says we need to meditate day and night. I don't think he means that we just need to meditate always, but he means consistently and with order. When you get up, read and pray and reflect. When you go to sleep, read and pray and reflect. And what's happening naturally is you'll probably be thinking about those verses throughout the day. You'll be meditating in your, in your maybe in your mind. People might think you're weird if you're just blah, 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 blah. If you want to do that, do that, if that works. But you'll be thinking about scripture naturally all day. Here's what I do. Just here's one example. A friend and I are going through a, a series on prayer. And here's what we do. We read, uh, we did a survey. If you were that prayer is mentioned in the Bible, you can Google it. We all have these tools, right? So we have a survey of all the, the prayer scripture in the Bible. We read one of those a day. Some of them are, are one verse. Other ones are five verses. It's not a whole lot of reading. And then we text each other. How are you going to pray today? That involves application. I need to think like, okay, the, the text said this. So I, how am I going to apply it? That takes study. I have to look into it and say, what does this mean for my life? That takes understanding. I got to, you know, this is what it might have meant for them. What does it mean for me? And then I actually, we pray. We get involved. Let the scripture physically change how your life is, is going that day. And then at the end of the night, we'll reflect. We'll ask him, how, how did your prayer go? How was your day? Did it affect you at all? What happened today? How would we meditate over this passage? You might say, okay, ble blessed is weird. Maybe I'll, I'll look up what that word means. What does it mean to meditate on the law like we've done here? What about a, a tree in water? Okay, I get that. What's chaff? I don't know what chaff is. And then I might pray over myself. Once I, I understand and I might say, God, I, I don't feel like I'm meditating as much as I should. Um, give, me the, give me the encouragement to, to pray and read more frequently and give me the encouragement to, to pursue you. I feel, like, I feel like chaff. I feel dry. I want to be soaked in the Holy Spirit. Help me. If we were to meditate like this over the scriptures day and night, we would be just soaked in godly wisdom. Uh, Keller has a talk about meditation, and he, he has an interesting point about how we pray. He says oftentimes, and there's nothing wrong with these types of prayers, but he says a lot of times we have what's called calling prayer. You, you're calling out like, God, help me with my grades, help me with my significant other, help me with my school. My, my car, whatever it is, and those are fine. But do we ever have a, a leading prayer? We let God lead us in. He, he asks us, or he makes the claim that if we were to meditate like this, we're allowing God to speak first. We're allowing God to, to lead the conversation because I'm going to be praying over his word, not mine. I can liken it, you can, you can put it this way, if, if, if Calvin were to come up to me and say, hey, have you heard of Trump? I'd be like, yeah, but, well, geez, now I have to talk about Trump, don't I? Because he led the conversation with that. I, Calvin, that's not, I don't know. <laughs> First face I saw. Um, that's a leading conversation. I'm allowing something to control where the, the conversation goes. And, and he's just asking us, you know, where do you, where do you let your prayers go? Are you leading the conversation or is God? And this is one way that you can let God. It's interesting, too. People are like, well, I don't, I don't know how to let God lead um, because we know that God's voice is still and small. There's only one, one place in the Bible where God's voice is likened to still and small, and that's 1 Kings 19. Everywhere else, it's something booming, something dramatic, something exciting. In Job, he's likened to a whirlwind. In Exodus, an earthquake. 1 Samuel, Job, Psalm John, and Revelation, and probably a lot more. He's likened to thunder. That's pretty loud. I don't think there's anything still and small about God. I think it's probably easier for us to sit with the scoffers instead of sitting down at the table with God and allowing him to speak. 
okay, so, you know, we're, we're getting it. We're supposed to, to meditate on the scripture, but why? Like, what does that actually do to help me? Um, and that comes to our second point. In Psalms uh, 3, or sorry, 1, verses 3 through 4, it says um, that scripture-saturated people are like something. It reads, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff that wind drives away. So we're likened to a tree. Trees, you know, they develop a deep root system to be able to reach that water. And the water doesn't have to be coming from the sky, right? It doesn't have to be raining for that tree to be surviving because he's getting his water from an internal source, something that's not leaving him, something that's not circumstantial. This water, or this tree, rather, has a permanent water source. And this tree doesn't grow based on outside circumstances. That's, that's a, a key part of this is, you know, we, we're going to see, too, that we're like seasons. And, you know, if a tree has a significant water source, it doesn't matter if the, the fruit is actually there. Even in winter, even in dry seasons, it's going to be growing whether or not we see fruit. And we're likened to the same. As long as we're constantly pouring in, well, getting poured in, rather, um, from the scripture, even in our bad seasons, we're going to be growing. And the interesting thing about the roots, roots, right, is when a storm comes, trees aren't moving. They're not going anywhere because it has roots. Uh, you know, I, I don't know your life experience, um, and many of you probably don't know mine, but I've got, I've got a friend who um, suffered for most of his life with Lyme's disease and um, a lot of other uh, immune disorders, and um, he passed with the Lord uh, a little over a year ago, and he, his root system was so deep. He was never worried about his condition. He was worried about other people around him, which just was evidence of a great root, root system in Scripture. Um, and that's how he spoke. It just came naturally in the midst of his pain, he was focused on God. He was still drawing a life source that no one could see because his, his being wasn't by outside circumstances. Deeper roots mean that larger storms will not overcome you. If we uh, prosper like a tree, it says, um, that we yield fruit in season, so we went over that. The interesting thing, like the water is coming out, and what comes out on top? It's fruit. It's not more water. So we're not, we're not inhaling scripture so that we can just spew out more scripture to people. It's so that we can produce fruit. It's so that we can have something else come out from, uh, um, from us. And then two, the, the leaf does not wither. In the worst storms, the tree planted by water will not die. You will not die because your, your leaf does not wither. It's interesting, too, the last point about the trees. Um, through tough seasons, you know what happens to the roots? They don't stop growing. Actually, they get, they get deeper because they're looking for more sustenance. They're looking for that water. And I think oftentimes, you know, anyone that's gone through a tragedy knows that that's when they're pulled closer to God because their roots have to grow deeper to find that water. So, you know, we, we need to draw up the word into us. We need to live it out. We need to, to meditate on the law, the scripture, meditate on Jesus, um, because he's that living water, right? If we want to be blessed, if we want to have a shri, you have to draw up that water. Um, there's a really famous um, song called It Is Well With My Soul. It was written by Horatio. Spafford in uh, 1873, and he goes like this. Uh, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Did you catch that? To find out if things are well with your soul, you need to be taught. This isn't just something that comes up naturally. You have, to, you have to teach your soul to say, I know things are, are, are happening right now, but it's okay. 
because my happiness, my ashray, is not based off of those circumstances. It's well with my soul. I don't know if you know the history of that song. Horatio was, I think, a famous lawyer. He was rich, lived in Chicago, and um, one of his, his law firms like burned up. He lost everything, all of his money, all of his wealth. And um, he was destroyed over it. And uh, he was going to counseling, and his counselor was like, you know what, you need to get away. You should probably um, take your family, go on a trip, relax, take some time off. He agreed. So he sent his uh, family ahead of him. He had to stay back a few days. And they were going to England. They were traveling over the sea. And um, he stayed back. He got a phone call from his law firm about some stuff he had to do. Well, one or two days into the trip, he got another phone call saying that that ship had crashed into uh, a ship off the British Isles and, and his whole family died. So he lost all of his wealth. His family dies in the ocean. And then he writes, it's well with my soul. Horatio knew how to put his, his roots down into Jesus. There's a warning about what happens if we're not like this. If we're not like the tree, there's something else. What is that? The text says that we become like chaff. Chaff is, I mean, it's, it's a weird word. We, a lot of us probably don't know what it is, but it's basically the, the outside, the husk of wheat. If you think of, if you've ever gone to a baseball game and you, you're eating seeds, you probably get some of this chaff <laughs> stuck in your teeth. It's that little shell, right? It's, it's annoying. It has no purpose whatsoever. Um, and, and what does the text say? It can be blown away like wind. It's light. It's hollow. There's no substance to chaff. Well, if you're not like the tree, this is what we are. We're a shell of what we could be. There's no root system in a, in a husk. It's hollow, and you're just, you're like the wind could blow you away. You're controlled by circumstances because you're not rooted in something. You're not stable. And this leads me to my, to my third and final point. The, the saturation that we get from Scripture leads us to prosperity. And remember, we're not talking prosperity gospel, but a, a, a deeper sense of happiness. It says in verse 5, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation, or congregation rather, of the righteousness. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the wicked will perish. So the wicked will fall, they will perish, and in contrast, the righteous will prosper. We're not talking about materialism, but but we're talking about a prosperity like a tree. In everything he does, he will prosper like a tree. So God, the text isn't, isn't promising you that you're not going to go through tough times. It's, it's where we get, you've heard people say, like, I'm going through a season. That's where we get it from. We're like trees. Sometimes there's bad times in our life. It's a season. It doesn't mean you stop growing. You're going to prosper like a tree. Eventually, after your roots dig deeper, you bear fruit. Some of us might be thinking, you know, this is really hard. I'm supposed to rejoice in the law, meditate on it day and night. It sounds exhausting. I have work, kids, distractions. I have not enough time and maybe not enough desire. What is our focus? C.S. Lewis has some insight for this problem, desire, a focus. He says in Mere Christianity, nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, ruin, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else is thrown in. Did you catch that? If you look for yourself, all this bad stuff will happen to you. If you look for happiness, ashray, you're not going to find it. The text doesn't say, how happy is the man who looks for happiness? How blessed is the man who tries to be blessed? Jesus didn't say, blessed is he who is blessed. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't work. You can't look for happiness and get it. Lewis says, if you look for Christ, 
you will find him and everything else gets thrown in. If you look for Christ, you get him and happiness as a byproduct. Simply put, the additive is aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you get neither. I'm reminded of the prodigal son, uh, another famous story. The, um, you know, we probably know it. The, the son is wrapped with lust for money, entertainment. Um, he wants to take his, his father's inheritance and pursue everything he can with that. So his dad gives him it, and the son leaves. He pursues happiness, and we know what happens. All of that just crumbles. He, he, all the money goes away. He loses it all, and he comes back to the house just a wreck. He knows that he's failed. So he's finally stopped seeking happiness, and he comes back to the father to seek the father. And what does the father do? He doesn't give him a, a guilt trip. He doesn't wag his finger at him and say, I can't believe you lost all this. He opens his arm and throws him a party. You see, the prodigal son comes back, and he pursues the father, and he gets a party. He gets the happiness that he wanted, but not because it was his focus. And we might be understanding these stories, might be clicking, but you're just, some of us might still be thinking, this is just too much, I can't do it. There's just, there's no one who can. Well, there was one person who did. And it would be wise to follow his example. Do you know what Jesus did most of his life? Because it's not actually, it's not all written, right? John says if everything was written, we wouldn't have enough pages to, to contain. But he, he meditated. The one thing he did more, he, more than healings, more than preaching, definitely more than, than hanging around in crowds, he meditated. We don't know about Jesus' ministry until he started when he was 30 years old, give or take. What was he doing all that time up until he was 30? He was meditating. He was preparing. He was, he was asking the Father to lead him in conversation by going to Scripture. He wanted to know what the will of the Father was so that he could say, my will is to do the will of the Father. You can't say that unless you know what the Father's saying. He was meditating. He was becoming saturated like a tree in, in Scripture. When he finally started his ministry, what did he do? He spoke constantly about Scripture. Not because he was trying to show off, not because he was trying to one-up people, but simply because Scripture was so integrated into who he was, it flowed out naturally. It became his identity. What do you think was meant in John 4 when he said, my food is meant, or my food is to do the will of him who sent me? Jesus literally fed. He was fed by the things of God, and that was his sustenance. He was like a tree by the stream. And he says that the law was written on his heart and that he delights to do the will of the Father. That's Hebrews 10. He's, he's sounding a lot like the Psalm 1's man, the man who delights to listen, the man who likes to meditate, the man who likes the law of the Lord. The word, the word of the Father is so integrated into who he was that it took no effort for him to speak Scripture. We see it in his preaching on the Sermon on the Mount early in the morning, Mark 1, um, at night in Luke 6. So there's his meditation day and night. At the age of 12 in Luke 2, we find out that he's running to the temple. He's... <laughs> He leaves his mom and dad. He runs to the temple, and then when they find him, he's like, didn't you know I'd be here? Of course I'm going to be at the temple because he's pursuing this thing. We see him then, after a lifetime of being soaked in Scripture, what happens? He starts his ministry, and he's tempted by Satan. Luke 4 says that he was tempted in the wilderness. He was there for 40 days, and the devil says, you know, you're hungry. You're looking pretty starved right now. Why don't you turn this rock into bread? And Jesus replies with Deuteronomy 8. Man should not live on bread alone. Later, in that same temptation, the devil offers him all of the power of the world, if only he would bow to Satan. Jesus responds again with scripture, Deuteronomy 6. You shall worship no other Lord but the Lord your God. And then finally, I mean, he was so saturated 
It comes out of him in his death. Do you remember those famous words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what he was saying? He might have been in anguish, yeah. But that's not what he was talking about. He was referring to Psalm 2, or 22, sorry. And you know that he, he knew the rest of it. The psalm starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And later in verse 14, it says, I am poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is melting within me. My, my strength is dried up like clay. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the dead. Jesus isn't just dying here. It's not a normal death. He's becoming chaff. He's becoming a hollowed version of himself. He's drying up. He's uprooting himself on a cosmic scale. And he's being blown away. He's turning into nothing. This man, so saturated with scripture, pours himself out even at death. And we might be asking, how, do, how does this work? You know, why, why does Jesus have to die? He's powerful. The answer is this. Um, you remember the story of the woman at the well? This woman is at the well. Shouldn't be there. Um, it's the middle of the day. Most women went in the morning when it was cold. There was something wrong with her. She was an outcast. And Jesus says to the woman at the well, do you want a water that will never make you thirsty again? And she says, yes, give it to me. And he says, you're looking at it. And what did Jesus say on the cross? He said, I thirst. On that day, he gave the woman the living water, and he gave it to us too. He has it. He has the living water, but he gave it up. He became nothing so that we could have it. The law, the scripture, Jesus, can be delightful to meditate over if you only realize what it's really about. If you understand what Jesus has done for you, if you understand that all of Scripture is about him, then it becomes a delight to meditate on. It's much easier to put your roots down and to meditate when you give up and you say, thank you, Jesus. I'm done trying to have authority. I'm done trying to have control, and I'm, this has the authority, not me. Take it. And the more you meditate on scripture, the more you'll know, the more you'll see Jesus. If you meditate on Jesus, you'll become more like the man or woman that Psalms 1 is talking about. Psalm 1 is talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ is the scripture-saturated man that emptied himself for us. So how do we do it? How do we cherish the law? You meditate on Jesus. You want to be blessed, happy, ashre. You have to focus on Jesus when happiness gets thrown in. If you focus on happiness, you get neither. Become like the tree. Soak in the word of the living water, and you'll find happiness in him. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Um, Our heart goes out to you for the ways that you give up everything to us. We do not have a relationship with a distant being. We do not have a relationship with someone who says, give everything to me and then I'll love you. No, Father. You came down and you gave first. There was no insecurity 
in coming into your arms, you will not hurt us because you took on the pain so that we wouldn't have to. Lord, thank you for becoming chaff so that we wouldn't have to. And give us the desire to meditate on you more and more each day. In your name we pray. Amen. So in a moment, we're going we're gonna, to um, transfer into a time of reflection. We're going to, you see the, the cup and the bread up here. Um, just take this moment to, to confess your sins to Jesus. Ask him for, your, for forgiveness and, um, and remember what he's, he's done for you. This is his blood and his body broken for you. And we do this in remembrance of him. Thanks. Thanks.